so good to see everyone. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. And we are ready to study our Torah portion this week, which is Ve'et Hanan, which is found in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, second Torah portion of Deuteronomy. And in your blue art scroll Chumash, if that's what you're following with, it's on page 958. So let me start by saying that I'm assuming everyone could hear me, right? Put up a thumb if you could hear me, so I just know that everyone could hear me. There you go, beautiful, thank you. So what is um, very special about this week's Torah portion is that it has in it both the Ten Commandments and the Shema. So two major portions of the Torah. The Shema, of course, we recite every morning and every evening. And the Ten Commandments are both found in this week's Torah portion. So that's the two uh, highlights, so to speak, of this week's Torah portion. Although I always make a disclaimer by saying that every verse in the Torah is a highlight. But as far as our excitement level of familiarity, Ten Commandments and the Shema are we renowned sections and portions of the Torah. But that's not the main storyline. The main storyline is what the Torah portion is named Be'et Hanan. And Be'et Hanan means, and I pleaded, I prayed. But a particular kind of prayer. We usually think of prayer is Ve'et Palel or Ve'et Palal, I prayed. It's Moses saying, I prayed. But he doesn't use the word for tefillah, prayer, but he uses the word Et Hanan. And the rabbis explain, and Rashi is the first one to note this in the very first Rashi of the Torah, that the word et chanan has the word chinam, free, which means undeserved. There's two ways to pray to God. One way is, God, you owe it to me. I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. After all, I've done this for you, and I've been a good Jew, and I've followed your commandments, and you know I'm such a good person. And therefore, God, I demand it. I expect it. The other way to pray to God is et chanan. God, I know I don't deserve it. I'm asking for your kindness. I'm asking for your mercy. I'm asking for your compassion. I'm asking for a free pass, so to speak. Now, this is quite mind-boggling because what is Moses praying for in this verse? He's praying to be allowed entry into the land of Israel. We know that God told him after he struck the rock, you cannot go into the land of Israel separate discussion why he was punished so severely but now he's praying to god please allow me into the land of israel and instead of saying god i worked 40 years for you i led the jews out of slavery brought them to the promised land don't i deserve to go in after everything i've done i've put up with this nation for 40 years their quarrels their complaints their rebellion I dealt with Pharaoh, I, I, I did everything you asked me to do. Okay, I made one mistake, I struck the rock. For this, I can't realize my life goal and dream to go into the land of Israel. But yet Moshe Benu in his great humility, and this is what our rabbis say, that the way of the righteous is that even if they have a basis to say I'm deserving of something, they don't view themselves as deserving they deserve it as matnat chinam, a free gift. God, do it out of your love, out of your compassion, out of your mercy. Now, this is a very valuable lesson for all of us because we could go through life feeling I'm entitled to certain things or we could feel like I'm not entitled to anything. Whatever God gives me is a gift. And the question is, what is the happier way to live your life? So, you know, a lot of times you see advertisements or speakers or whatever you know promoting something and they say you know you should get this or you should do that why because you deserve the best or people will say that you know you really deserve the best you deserve and the question is regardless of whether you deserve or you don't deserve what is a better way to live your life should you think you deserve things well if you think you deserve things then you're disappointed if you don't get it because i deserve it but if you realize you don't deserve anything, then you appreciate everything you receive. I'll give you a simple example. If you put in a, 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 a month's work and your employee employer gives you your paycheck, are you jumping for joy? No, you're like, okay, I worked 
I got my paycheck. I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. But if your employer says, here's your paycheck, but here's a bonus because you did a great job, you didn't expect it. You didn't feel like you deserved it necessarily. And now you received it. So you overjoyed because the bonus it brings you greater joy than the actual paycheck because the paycheck you felt you deserved. The bonus you didn't deserve necessarily. You got it as a gift. Same thing with life. You could look at life as I'm entitled to this life. I'm deserving of this life. Or it's a gift. And the simple question is that we all have to ask ourselves is, what did I do to deserve to be born? Obviously nothing because you weren't born yet, so there's nothing you could have done to deserve it. So therefore, your very existence is a gift that God gave you life. So when you live life from that perspective, now, I want to tell you that there's a difference between feeling you don't deserve it, but at the same time feeling that you expect it. So, you know, Sometimes people will say, don't have any expectations, because if you have expectations, you're just going to be disappointed when your expectations are uh, not met. So lower your expectations and you will have no disappointments. Whatever you get, you'll be happy. But that's not the right attitude. Why? First of all, because we believe that Hashem loves us. And if Hashem loves us, we have every reason to expect that he's going to give us what we want. So if you need something from your father or your mother, Assuming your father and your mother is capable of giving you what you want and assuming that they're a healthy father and mother, when you pick up the phone to ask them for something, you have every expectation that they're going to say, of course, you need help with the kids. Of course, I'm going to come help with the kids. You need some money alone. Of course, I'm going to lend you money. Whatever you need, I'm there for you. Why? Because your parents are capable and they're also healthy, wonderful, loving parents. So, of course, they're going to do it. How much more so when we call upon our Father in Heaven, Hashem. Hashem is obviously capable of anything we want or need. He can, is capable of providing for us, whether it's health or happiness, or we need a, a marriage, or we need for ourselves, for our children, if we need livelihood. God can provide all of that. And He's, he's a loving parent. He's, a, he's, a, he's the ultimate healthy parent. So, of course, when I ask God for something, I have every reason to expect Him to say yes and to give it to me. Now, sometimes parents say no to their kids. Maybe a kid says, you know, mom, dad, could you help me out financially? The parent wants to do it, but the parent says, you know, I, I need to teach my kid how to work hard and make a living on their own because if they're always reliant and dependent on me, they're not going to learn how to be self-sufficient. So for your own benefit, your parent says no to you. Same thing, sometimes God has his reasons. He says, now's not the time for this blessing to materialize. I have something else lined up for you. You have to have patience. But under normal circumstances, when we ask God for something, we have every reason to believe he's going to give it to us. So expectations, yes. But deserving, absolutely not. Whatever God gives us, our very existence is all a gift. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us this lesson. Why? Because our rabbis say, if you add up the numerical value of the word ve'et chanan, it equals 515. Uh, Aleph is one, tough is 400. Ches is eight, uh, nun is 50, and a second nun is 50. So with the vav, vav is six, aleph is one, that's seven. Tuf is 400, that's 407. And then the chet is eight, that's 415. And then the two nuns is 50 and 50 is 515. And our rabbis say that Moses prayed five, 115 prayers relentlessly asking God to allow him to go into the land of Israel. And God obviously said no to Moses 515 times. And the strongest no, you say, well, why did Moses stop at 515? I mean, he already asked 515 times. Why not ask 516, 517? And the only answer is because God told him, stop asking me. It's very much like a parent who says, don't ever ask me again. If you ask me one more time, da, 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 right? So if you look in the opening verses, I just want to read it. It's very moving. But Hanan el Hashem, Moses tells the Jews, I pleaded to God at that time saying, Almighty God, my Lord Hashem Elohim, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. 
For what power is there in the heaven or on earth that can perform according to your deeds and according to your mighty acts? In other words, God, you performed all these amazing miracles when you took the Jews out of Egypt and you showed us how powerful you are. And now he says, Ebrana, please allow me to cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain in the Lebanon. But Hashem became angry with me because of you and he did not listen to me. Hashem said to me, it is too much for you. Do not continue to speak to me further about this matter, but rather, and tell me where you heard these words before. Let's see if you could find it in your minds. Ascend to the top of the cliff and raise your eyes westward, northward, southward, and eastward and see with your eyes, for you shall not cross this Jordan. But you shall command Joshua and strengthen him and give him resolve and he shall cross before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land that you will see. And of course, it was Martin Luther King on April 3rd, uh, 1968 when he was, gave his speech in Memphis, Tennessee, where he said, I've climbed to the mountaintop, I've looked over, I've seen the promised land, and although I may not get there, I want you to know that we as a community will one day reach the promised land. And the very next day, he was assassinated. And his final speech, he resonated, he quoted Moses, a Jewish leader, and he said, I feel like Moses, I may not get to the promised land, but my people will get there one day. And this is a very, um, so, so God tells him you cannot ask anymore. And that's why he stops praying. So what does Moses show us? Moses, Moses shows us that our faith in God's deliverance has to be wholehearted. We have to keep on asking God, say, God, you're our father. Please, please grant it to us. Just like you would continuously ask your own parent to give you what you need. At the same time, I know I'm not deserving. And Moses could have said, I've done this, I've done that, I've been your faithful servant. But no, he says, God, it's a gift. Grant me this gift. But ultimately, God does not allow him to go in, but rather Joshua has to carry on the leadership of the Jewish people and be the one to lead them into the land of Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu's reign ends at this point, and he cannot go any further. But of course, through his words and his inspiration, the Jewish people live on in the land of Israel and throughout the world, and he lives on with the Jewish people throughout uh, all of Jewish history, very much alive in all of our uh, minds, hearts, and all of our deeds each and every day. Moses lives on with all of us. So that is the opening section of this week's Torah portion. <clears throat> Now, we can't, I want to go to the, um, Moshe Rabbeinu is giving this very eloquent speech that he started last week. This is a speech that he gave for the last 37 days of his life. And, you know, Moses, when God came to him at the burning bush, he said, I'm not a man of words. Lo ish devarim anochi. And God said to him, well, who gave man a mouth to speak? Is it not I? And now he gives this most eloquent speech. Uh, that lasts for 37 days, his final message. And it began last week with Elad Burn. These are the words. So the man who said, I'm not a man of words, now became the most eloquent speaker whose words resonate and echo throughout all of human history. As I mentioned, even Martin Luther King, a Christian uh, pastor, quoted Moses from this speech that he gave at the end of his life. And in the opening section in chapter four of this week's Torah portion, Moses tells the Jewish people something very important that I think is very relevant uh, and, and is really the secret to Jewish continuity till this very day. Because we have to ask ourselves, how is it that Moses' words, you know, I once heard that Einstein was once asked, Albert Einstein was asked, if there's one person in history that you can go back and talk to, who would you want to talk to? And Albert Einstein said, I would want to talk to Moses. They said, why would you want to talk to Moses? And he said, I would like to ask Moses if he ever thought that the Jewish people would still be following his laws. And it is a remarkable uh, f fact that 3,300 years after Moses passes away, we are still following the commandments of Moses that he brought down from heaven, from God, that he communicated from Hashem to us. And so the question is, how did Moses achieve that? And obviously it's a, 
a broad question with many answers, but one secret is right here in this verse. We know there are 613 commandments in the Torah, but one of the 613 commandments is that we must not, may not, add or subtract from any of the commandments of God. Moses tells the Jewish people, Lo totifu, do you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor shall you subtract to it to observe the commandments of Hashem your God that I command you. In other words, what God's saying, what Moses is saying to the Jewish people is, don't tamper with the formula. You know, imagine, I always use this analogy, somebody goes to the Louvre in Paris and says, you know, I think I could improve on the Mona Lisa. Let me take out my paintbrush and add a little more color here, a little more color there. When you, when you have a masterpiece, then adding is actually subtracting. And therefore, Moses says to the Jewish people, not only shouldn't you subtract, which is more obvious, you can't eliminate any of the commandments that God gave you, but you can't even add commandments. You can't ever say, well, I know more. I have a new idea, a new a 614th commandment. Throughout Jewish history, we've remained true to the commandments of Hashem. Because if God wanted us to have a 614th commandment, he would have given us that commandment. And the Torah says, don't add or subtract. Because once you feel you have the power to add, then obviously you'll feel like you have the power to subtract. Now, that doesn't mean that the Torah doesn't have to be applied in every generation to modern circumstances. The world is changing. And whether it's the laws of Shabbat or whatever area of life, there are new circumstances that warrant new interpretations and new applications. But it's the exact same 613 commandments. We don't deviate one iota. We don't eliminate or add to any of the commandments. And we've seen that throughout Jewish history, those movements that have tried to alter the Torah, to repackage it, to, re, to rewrite it in a more modern language applicable to the times and say, well, this is not so relevant anymore. Maybe we can do away with whatever commandment they may believe is not you know, modern, you know, mikvah for women maybe, or maybe we don't need to keep kosher anymore. Maybe we don't have to keep Shabbos anymore. We could do something else, substitute it with some other commandment, or try to make new modern, you know, initiatives to make uh, new uh, commandments that are now considered sacred. Those movements, unfortunately, you know, they come and they go because they're not eternal. The Torah is eternal. It spans all the generations, all times. It speaks to every generation. It's not what is the fad of that generation or what, what's popular in that particular. You know, if you look at um, the greatest books that have ever been written, you know, even classics, you know, they may last for hundreds of years. How does a book speak to people thousands of years later? And, you know, the answer, obviously, is that it's a divine document and it transcends time and space. And therefore, it's relevant to every Jew and every time in every single place. I'll just tell you a cute little story that the Dubna Magid gives to explain this particular commandment, not to add or subtract from any of the commandments of Hashem. He says that um, there was once this fellow who came to his neighbor and he said, you know, I'm going away on a vacation. Could you do me a favor? I have this gold watch. Could you watch it for me? And the neighbor said, sure. He came back a few weeks later from his vacation. He said, do you have my gold watch? He said, sure. He went to get it and he bought him two gold watches. And he said, why are you giving me two? He says, oh, while you were away, your watch gave birth, had a baby. So I'm giving you both watches. The neighbor looks at him like, this guy is insane, but if he thinks my watch gave birth, I'll take two. The next week, he brings him his candelabra. He says, you know, I uh, have this candelabra. I'm going away. Could you watch it? He says, sure. He comes back two weeks later. You have my candelabra. He says, he brings him three candelabras. He says, three. Why are you bringing me three? He says, because while you're away, your candelabra gave birth to twins. So I'm bringing you the twins. Three, three candelabras. He says, this guy is insane. Great. He takes it. And then he thinks, what's the most expensive item? So he has, he says, my wife's diamond ring. So he comes to his neighbor and he says, listen, I'm going away. Can you watch my wife's diamond ring? And the neighbor says, sure. When he comes back two weeks later from vacation, he says, do you have my wife's diamond ring? 
He says, I have sad news to tell you. He says, what, what's the sad news? He says, your wife's diamond ring died. He said, what? Are you crazy? A diamond ring can't die. The neighbor said, well, if the gold watch and the candelabra can have babies, why can't the diamond ring die? So the Dubna Magid says, God says, don't add and don't subtract. Why? Because if you feel like you could add, then you feel you have license to subtract. And therefore, remain true to the word of Hashem and do not deviate. And it's remarkable that 3,300 years later, the Jewish people still follow the same commandments. Whether it's kosher, we don't say, well, today we have the you know, FDA approved food. You know, we know it's healthy. We don't need kosher. No, kosher is as relevant and binding today as it was when it was given. And, and we don't say, well, maybe on Shabbat today we could do certain things because, you know, we have technology and therefore it's not so labor intensive. You know, I could ride my, uh, maybe I could get on my tractor and, um, and mow my lawn because it's not work. I just have to sit in this vehicle and drive it. I don't have to sit there and cut the grass physically. It's not really hard work. No, we say the same laws apply today as they did then, and they're binding. And that's the beauty of it. You know, if Moshe Rabbeinu were to come alive today and walk into our synagogues anywhere in the world, he would recognize the exact Judaism that he bequeathed to us. He would see us putting on tefillin in Shul. That's what he tells us in this week's Torah portion in the Shema. And you should bind them for a sign upon your hand and between your eyes. He would come to your home, your home, and he would see a mezuzah on the door. And he would say, ah, that's the mezuzah I told them to put on their doorpost in the Shema. You should ascribe them on the doorposts of your home and your gates. That's Moses' words in the Shema to us this week. He would literally see the way we are still doing everything he instructed us to do. And in the Ten Commandments that he gives to us in this week's Torah portion, he says, guard the day of Shabbat and make it holy. He would come to our house on Friday night. He would see the Shabbat table. He would see us making the Kiddush. And he would say, ah, this is the Shabbat I told him to observe. Obviously from God, but he would see that we're still doing what he told us to do. So it's very important. It's okay if a person is growing in their Judaism and they're not observing everything and say, okay, right now I'm not ready to do all of the commandments. I'm going to take on another mitzvah, and maybe next month is another mitzvah, and I'll continue to grow in my observance of Judaism. But never try to alter the Torah. Never try to reduce the commandments to your measurement, to your lifestyle. And that's the, the, the terrible fallacy that many people have made where they try to adjust the Torah to the times or to their lifestyle. We have to realize we have to raise ourselves up to the way of the Torah, to the standards, to the expectations and the commandments of the Torah. And yes, we can do it gradually. We, 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 we're not expected to do it all at once. It's a gradual journey of life, but we have to realize that we cannot lower the Torah. I'll tell you a story I once heard that there was once this, um, you know, when you go to a town, Many towns have a watchtower, right? They have a big tower in the middle of town. Even here in Palm Beach, in the middle of the town, there's the, there's the, 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 the council, uh, they, they call it the, um, you know, the town council uh, center, you know, media, it's, the, it's the, you know, the administrative offices of the town of Palm Beach. And there's a big tower and there's a clock on it. And that's the way it was in the olden days. There was always a clock in the tower. So the question is, why is the clock always so high up in the tower? Why is it always a watchtower, you know, with a clock on it? And the answer was that there was once this town, they said, you know, let's lower the clock. Instead of it being all the way up, they're going to lower it. So what happened was this first guy came along and said, oh, the, the time is wrong on the, on the clock. Uh, tower so he started changing the handles to adjust it to his clock then the next guy came along and said oh i think it's wrong let me until everyone fidged with it and until it broke right so that's why the tower the watch has to be high up that nobody should touch it the torah is like that watch tower you know it's we set our clock to it we set our life to the values and the standards of the torah and i think today we look around the world we see besides the pandemic 
but we see now the anarchy, the chaos. You know, when each, each man for themselves, each person decides what's moral, what's ethical, what's right, what's wrong. Everyone's changing the values and the principles and the morality and the ethics to fit their beliefs and their style, uh, of their way of life. Then we end up with a broken system rather than one standard that everyone has to adjust their lives and their standards to. So now we continue uh, in this t Torah portion. And in that we have the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now, we all know that the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai when God revealed himself to the Jewish people after they left Egypt. Here, Moses is doing a review of the Ten Commandments. However, what's fascinating is that it's the same Ten Commandments, but it's reworded. And there are a number of differences. So, for example, let's take the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, to keep the day of Shabbos holy. Why do we keep Shabbos? Why do we observe a day of rest? So in the book of Exodus, the reason was because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. So the reason we keep Shabbat is to remember that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Now that in itself is very fundamental because obviously you know the story about this um, this little girl who comes to her mother and says, Mom, where do we human beings come from? So the mother says, well, God made Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden and they had children and they had children all the way down the generations till we were born. So the girl says, but Mommy, I asked Daddy where we human beings come from and Daddy said, well, it's all evolution that originally there were the apes and the monkeys and the gorillas, and we evolved into human beings over time. We lost our tails and we evolved into human beings. So I'm confused. Daddy told me we come from apes and monkeys and chimpanzees, and you tell me we come from Adam and Eve. And the mom said, well, daddy told you about his side of the family. And I'm telling you about my side of the family, right? There are people, sadly, who walk around in this world believing that they evolved from monkeys and apes and chimpanzees. They're just like a sophisticated monkey or, or a chimpanzee. Shabbat is when we stand up and we make kiddush and we say, no, we did not evolve from animals. We were created in the divine image. God made every human being fashioned in the image of God, as it says in Genesis. And therefore, I have a godly soul in me. And I have godly ideals and values to live by and commandments and a Torah. So it's a whole different worldview of outlook. So that's the reason for the observance of Shabbat every week, a weekly reminder that there is an architect and a, uh, an author to life. And we were put here with a divine purpose and plan to our existence. And it makes all the difference in the world because you know the expression monkey see, monkey do. Monkeys just copy each other. Some human beings, they're just busy trying to fit in with everyone else and do what everyone else is doing. It's a full-time job, keeping up with everyone else. But if you realize, I'm not here to copy anyone else. I'm here to be an original. I'm here to be myself, to follow my divine image in God's image, the one God. Shema Yisrael in this week's Pasha, the hero is with the Lord is a God, the Lord is one, and I'm in the image of one divine God. And therefore, I'm a one and only you know, you unique human being put on this earth for a particular purpose and mission. But that's the reason given for the fourth commandment back in the book of Exodus. In this week's Torah portion, Moses gives a different reason. He says, you know why God gave you the day of Shabbat? To remind you that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt and God made you a free people. And therefore, since you're a free person, you should take a day off to rest. And by the way, if you want to be proud to be a Jew, one of the beautiful aspects of Shabbat is that it says in the commandment that not only you shall rest, you, your sons, your daughters, your servants, your animals, your ox and your donkey, and all your animals and the stranger in your midst. In other words, the day of rest is universal. It's not like the master rests and the slave works. Judaism says you got to give your animals a day of rest. The ox in the field deserves a day off. The donkey deserves a day off. That's the compassion that Judaism, that the Torah has 
for every, not only human life, but every life, every creature, every creation of God deserves its day of rest. You have to have empathy and sympathy for the poor animal that works six days a week. He deserves a day off. So that's the beauty of the day of Shabbat. The rich man and the poor man, everyone's equal. And God says, because you were once a slave, I gave you freedom, not that you should work seven days a week, but you should, have a, you should treat yourself as a human being. You have a higher purpose than to just work. Work is a means to an end. The end is not work or making money. The end is to, to have a day where you can reflect on your deeper meaning and purpose. And this is the two different reasons and why we have two sets. This is one example of the two different sets of commandments and what they teach us. That, and when we make Kiddush on Friday night, we actually say, we say, we give both reasons. We say, Yom HaShishi, in the sixth day, God completed the creation of the heaven and earth. And then we go on to say, that it's also a reminder for the exodus from Egypt. And so Shabbat is a weekly reminder that A, we're in God's image, created here for a purpose, and B, don't get so preoccupied with work that you forget your real purpose. You know, it's a story I just heard. Uh, about the Bab Rebbe after the concentration camps, when he came to America, he had a synagogue in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, and he was walking to Shul on Shabbat, and he sees a Jew uh, sitting in the park, and he says, "Good Shabbos." This was after the war, and um, he says, "Why don't you come to Shul with me to daven?" And the Jew says, "I don't." pray anymore. I, I don't believe in God anymore. But the Jews said, you know, I, um, I was once actually a chazan myself. Before the war in Europe, I was, a, I was the cantor. So the Baba Rebbe says, so come, you'll lead the service. for Allah. He convinced them to come. He came, he led the service. The next Shabbat, he goes through the park again, and he sees the Jews sitting there. And this time, he's sitting on the park bench, and he's smoking a cigarette on Shabbat, which is obviously forbidden on Shabbat. And he says to him, he's walking with his the son, Rabbi Naftali, and he says to this Jew, come again, you'll lead the service for us. And he convinces him to come. When he, after he, he brought him to shul, he led the service. Later, his son, Rabbi Naftali, asked his father, dad, Abba, Tata, the Jew was smoking on Shabbat. How could you invite him to lead the service on Shabbat in the service, in the synagogue, when you saw him desecrating Shabbat? This Jew was a Holocaust survivor. So the Baba Rebbe said to his son, he wasn't smoking. He says, what do you mean he wasn't smoking? We both saw him on the park bench smoking before you approached him and invited him to come. The Baba Rebbe said, it wasn't the Jew who was smoking. It was Hitler that was smoking. It was the Nazis that was smoking. Meaning the Jew, the suffering that he experiences is what caused him to lose his faith in God. And the son remembered the words of his father very powerfully that it's not the Jew that was smoking. It was the Gestapo that was, who beat him, who murdered his family that was smoking on Shabbat. Rabbi Naftali said many years later, after his father had passed away, a Jew comes to see him in his office. And he says, do you remember me? He says, no. He says, I'm here because I want to invite you. My son is getting married. I want you to come officiate at my son's wedding. He says, how do we know each other? He said, you remember you, when you and your father invited me into the synagogue to come pray? I was that Jew sitting on the park bench who was the cantor, and you invited me back in. And ever since then, I've come back slowly but surely, and now my son is getting married, and I want you to marry my son. And Ram Naftali said, I now realize my father was right. It wasn't the Jew that was smoking on Shabbat. The Jew wants to keep Shabbos, but unfortunately, the circumstances he went through led him to lose his faith in God. But ultimately, he reclaimed that faith and belief in Hashem. So another aspect of Shabbat, you know, there's a book, I don't know if you ever heard of this book, it's called Essentialism. It's a very popular book. It was popular a couple of years ago. And the idea of the book is, you know, today the word essential became very popular because essential workers, non-essential workers. But this book, Essentialism, you can look it up, it was a bestseller a number of years ago, it's built on one thesis. And the thesis is that in life, you have to 
choose what you say yes to. What's essential? Why? Because every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. So people often take on too much responsibility. They like to say yes. So this one asks you for this. This one, yeah, sure, sure, yes, yes, yes. But you always have to say, if I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? So a very simple example is, you know, someone says to me, you know, could, could I see you at uh, six o'clock tonight? I, I need to discuss something with you. Well, your first instinct is sure, I'll be happy to meet with you. You don't want to say no. But when you say yes to meet this person at six o'clock, you're saying no to having dinner with your wife and children or to doing homework with your children, right? Or if you say yes to this meeting, you say no to spending time studying or doing something else. So you always have to evaluate things from a yes, no perspective. And this guy wrote a whole book about this called Essentialism. If you look at the Ten Commandments, we find that the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, I'm still talking about the Fourth Commandment, which is Shabbat. The First Commandment starts in the book of Exodus, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat. Remember the day of Shabbat and make it holy. In this week's Torah portion, the fourth commandment begins with the word shamar, guard the day of Shabbat and keep it holy. On Friday night when we sing a chadodi, we say shamar v'zachor b'dibur echad, which means guard and remember was spoken in one utterance. And what does that mean? Why are there two different words? Remember and guard the day of Shabbat. What's the difference between remembering the day of Shabbat to make it holy or guarding the day of Shabbat to make it holy? And what does it mean in L'Chad when it says that they were both said together in one utterance? And the explanation is going back to this idea of yes and no. You know, there are two aspects to Shabbat. They're the things that we have to say yes to. Have Kiddush on Friday night, wear special clothing, have uh, two halot, uh, say special prayers, go to synagogue, read the Torah on Shabbat in the synagogue, all the things we say yes that we're going to do on Shabbat. But then there are things we have to say no to. We're not going to go to work. We're not going to use our telephones. We're not going to turn on the TV. We're not going to do all the things that we are forbidden from doing on Shabbat. And what it's saying is, in order to create Shabbat, you need both dimensions. You know, during quarantine now, a lot of Shabbats are spent at home. And you, of course, you have Shabbat meals and you pray, but it's not the same because you're not in the synagogue with the community and the Torah reading and all of the beautiful things we do on Shabbat. On the other hand, if a person goes to Shabbat services on Friday night and they pray and they may hear the Kiddush in the synagogue, but then they go out to the movies right afterwards or the next morning they get up and go to work, that's not Shabbat either. In other words, you need to guard the Shabbat, which means protect it from any intrusions, from any uh, interferences that will deprive it of the peacefulness and the tranquility and the rest of Shabbat. And then we have to infuse it with all the positive activities that make it sacred and joyous and meaningful and uplifting and a day of rest. So you need the two dimensions of remembering the positive aspects of Shabbat, but at the same time guarding it from anything else. The 10th commandment, in, in the, the Ten Commandments, which is in this week's Torah portion, of course. And by the way, one of the interesting things about the Ten Commandments is that God gave it on two stones. It says right here in this week's Torah portion, that God told Moses, write it on two stones. The question is, why did God have to put it on two stones? Why couldn't it be one long stone with one through ten? What's the emphasis on two tablets? We all know there are two tablets. It's funny, someone said that today with the tablets, you know, today we have new terms. Tablets is like a computer, right? A tablet. And we, we know we download things from the cloud, right? Put things in the cloud and we download it from the cloud onto our tablet. Well, Ten Commandments were downloaded from the cloud. Moses went up to the clouds, right? It describes the clouds and it downloaded these commandments on the two tablets. But why two tablets? Why not one long tablet? And I think Nancy was answering over there that it's the first fiber between man and God, the second fiber between man and man. And by putting it simultaneously, there's a very powerful lesson here. You know, if you're watching the news today in Israel, there's once again uh, 
violence in the north of Israel from Iran and Nasrallah and Hezbollah. I don't know if you've turned on any of the Israeli outlets, but uh, there's tensions in the northern border of Israel right now. And, you know, there are people who say, you know, there are people who say, well, I'm a religious person. And the most important thing is my relationship with God. And then there are people who say, no, the most important thing is my relationship with my fellow man, how I treat others. It's not important in my relationship with God. What matters is how I treat others. And Judaism says you have to have the two tablets side by side. They're both equally important. Our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow man. And if you look at you know, Islamic fundamentalism, what do we see? We see people who are very religious. They pray five times a day, not three times a day, like we do. They pray five times a day. They're more religious than us, right? But the religion is divorced from any morality. The same people who pray five times a day have no qualms to murder innocent men, women, and children in terrorist attacks, whether it's 9-11 or in Israel or anywhere else. Those people who flew those planes into the Twin Towers, their last words recorded in the black box was Allah Akbar. They were praising God as they're murdering. They're going to murder 3,000 people in the Twin Towers, or they intended to murder many more. Innocent men, women, and children who came to work on a normal day will never go home to their families and cause countless, endless grief and sorrow and misery. And they think they're worshiping God. Because when your tablet between man and God is divorced from man and man, and you don't respect, don't murder, don't steal, don't you know, do all the evil against your fellow man, then it's only one tablet. It's not Judaism. You have to have man and God and man and man. On the other hand, yeah, people say, well, why do I need to believe in God? Why can't I just be a good human being? And then we see Hitler or Stalin, people who were atheists, who didn't believe in a God. And therefore, the more their minds, the human mind is capable of rationalizing and justifying anything it wants to do. And therefore, they built a, an entire value system on the Aryan race and why they need to eliminate anyone that's not true blue bred German with blue eyes and blonde hair. And they discarded the second tablet, the first commandment being you shall not commit murder. If, if, if Hitler and Stalin listened to that one commandment, thou shall not commit murder, then there would be, you know, tens and tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people alive today, all the descendants of those people who were murdered. So yes, you should not murder, but why? Because I am the Lord your God. And therefore the Ten Commandments are not only read one through five and six through 10, but one, they're, they're read horizontally, one to six, meaning I am the Lord your God. And since every human being is in the image of God, you shall never murder another innocent human being. And what's the last command? The, the, the conclusion of the Ten Commandments, it's the commandment of not being envious and jealous of others. And perhaps this is like the, what the Torah is telling us is that all of the other violations against our fellow man, whether it is killing or stealing or bearing false witness, it all, or committing adultery, it all comes from envy. When you're not content with what God has given you and you feel that you have to act out against others because you're not, if you have faith in God and you believe God gave you, you know, I'm, I'm wearing glasses right now. Uh, no person is ever jealous of someone else's glasses because you have your prescription. I have my prescription. Your glasses on me is going to make my eyes blurry and my glasses on you is going to make your eyes blurry. As they say, if everyone put down their bag of tsars, their peckle, everyone would take theirs. So you can't be envious of someone else. And one of the insights the rabbi shares is do not be envious of the house of your neighbor, his servants, his, his animals, his, his wife, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And then it says, and everything that belongs to your neighbor. And what the Torah is intimating is that often when we're envious of people, we're selective. 
I wish I had this person's health. I wish I had this person's money. I wish I had this person's success. But we don't look at the whole picture. The same person you're envious of, what about the problems they have? Do you want their problems too? Because no one has everything. You're envious of their wealth, but what about the problems they have with their children or the problems they have with their health or the problems they have in some other area of life? You just want this person's uh, wealth, this person's health, this person's children. And it doesn't work. It's not a smorgasbord where you pick everyone's things. There's a package. Look at your whole life. You'll realize you have many blessings in your life. And, and, and that other person that you're envious has many problems too. And therefore, don't be envious. Be content and be grateful for the life that you have and the blessings that you have. And, and that will, that, that's why the first commandment and the last commandment of the Ten Commandments are connected. If you believe that you were created by God and God runs the world, then how could you question or complain what God has done? What are you saying? You know better than God how to do things? And even if you pray for something and you haven't received it, look at Moses in the beginning of the six parts. He prayed 515 times and God said no. So if God says no, there must be a reason. But don't lose your faith in Hashem regardless. Now we need to talk about the Shema because the Shema is another, as I said, major feature of this week's Torah Bosh. And by the way, every verse is very inspiring and uplifting. Moses is like really encouraging the Jewish people to remain faithful to God. But the opening verse is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And we all know when we say this prayer, we cover our eyes and declare our faith in Hashem. And the very next verse says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul. And the third verse says, You should study these words of Torah and keep it on your heart. And the fourth verse says, You should teach it to your children and discuss it with them, whether you're sitting in the house, going on the road, lying down, waking up. And then the next verse says, you should bind it on your hand and between your eyes, which is the fill in. And the last verse of the first paragraph of the Shema says, you should put it on the doorpost of your home. So let, let us begin with the fact that we cover our eyes when we say the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Why do we cover our eyes when we say this? So a very deep understanding is that Many times people misinterpret this verse. They say, Hero is with the Lord is a God, the Lord is one. There's one God. There's no two gods. There's no three gods. There's no multiple gods. Like in other religions, they believe in many gods. And obviously, that goes without saying. There's only one God. That's monotheism. Abraham discovered that. There's only one God, one force that controls everything. And obviously, that's essential to our belief in God. Because all human beings are created in the image of one God, and therefore we're all equal because we're all in the same divine image. If there were multiple gods, then maybe the God that I'm created in the image of it was greater than your God that you're in the image of. If we're all in the image of the same God, then we're all equal. But here is the Lord our God, the Lord is one, could also be translated as here is the Lord is our God, the Lord is the only one meaning that there is only God. Everything is God. God is one with everything in this world. So in other words, when we look out the window, we look at life, we don't see God. We see diversity. We see multiplicity. We see uh, many different things that seem to have their own independent existence or life force, even ourselves. We don't see that in a revealed way that we're connected to God. But in in Hasidic thought especially, it explains that we are no more than sunlight, okay? When you look out the window and you see the sun is shining, that is just a ray of the sun. If you were to take away the sun, the rays of the sun would disappear at that moment, right? When there's a cloud that passes the sun, suddenly there's no sunlight, right? The, sun, the rays of the sunlight isn't an entity unto itself. When I look out the window, oh, it's a beautiful sunny day. I'm not looking at the sun. I'm just looking at the sunlight on the earth. But the sunlight is just an extension of the sun. And without the sun, there is no sunlight. There is no ray of sun. Our dependency and our unity with God is like the rays of the sun with the sun. They're one and the same. We are no entity without the sun. And that's what the verse says. Ki God is the light of the sun and the shield, meaning that God does the following. On the one hand, he is the light. On the other hand, he shields us from too much light. Just like if you looked at the sun, you would be blinded. If the sun was too close to earth, we would get burnt up. 
So the sun has to remain at a certain distance and you can't look directly at the sun, but yet we're attached to the, the sunlight is connected to the sun at all time. And it actually explains when you talk about humility, it says the greater the person, the more humble they are. Why? You would think the opposite. The greater I am, the more arrogant I should be. He says, no, the greater the righteous person is, the more humble he is. Why? Because the greater you are means you're closer to the light of the sun. The rays of the sun recognize that they're one with the sun, the closer they are to the sun. Within the sun itself, you don't even notice the rays of the sun because it's concealed within the sun. So the righteous person who's closer to the source is more aligned with its source and therefore more nullified in its source and only feels its source, not itself. It's only when you're distant that you start to feel your own entity. So here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. It doesn't just mean there's one God. Obviously, there's one God. The profundity of the statement is there is only God. Everything is God. My whole being is godliness. The whole world is godliness. It's just that God concealed his light or his connection. You know, one of the verses we're going to see later on in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is where God says, man is like a tree in the field. And the question is, why are we comparing man to a tree in the field? I mean, yeah, of course, there are a lot of nice analogies. A tree bears fruit, man bears fruit, they're good deeds. But one of the, one of the many ideas is that every other creature or creation could pretend that it's independent from its life force. In other words, we could forget that we're dependent on God for life. Uh, an animal could seem, it roams the earth freely. It's independent of its life force. A stone, an inanimate object, surely doesn't recognize its life force. But a tree or a leaf even or a branch realizes it's dependent on its life force. If you detach the tree from its source, it dies. If you attach, detach even a leaf or a flower from its tree, it dies. So too, a man is like a tree in the field. We have to realize that we are dependent on our life force like the tree in the field. Without God, we have no life force. So that's the opening verse. Then is that you shall love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. I once heard this true story. It was this rabbi who this uh, member of his shul calls him. And he says, Rabbi, I just got a call from my daughter that she got involved with Christianity on campus. And she called me to tell her that she discovered God in Christianity and she wants to convert to Christianity. And the father, he wasn't a religious man. But he was Jewish. He was a proud Jew. He was, he was shocked to hear that his daughter, is, he wants to become, you know, give up being Jewish and become a Christian. Now, this was a family that didn't give their child much Jewish education, unfortunately. But they were Jews, proud Jews. And this girl calls and says, I want to become a Christian. So the rabbi says, uh, let me go to the campus. And he knew the girl from the temple. You know, let me go talk to your daughter. So he goes off. He's a good rabbi. He goes to the campus. He calls, I want to get together with you. Over. Let's talk. Let's have a cup of coffee. He starts talking to the girl. He says, you know, Jenny, why would you leave Judaism? Why would you convert to Christianity? And this girl says, rabbi, you know, I've always been looking for spirituality. And I haven't found any spirituality in Judaism. But Christianity has so much spirituality, so much so much love and beauty in it. And I feel so content, so satisfied, so complete, so fulfilled with this Christ Christian love. Love, love. And they have the most beautiful prayers, the most beautiful passages in their scriptures. And the rabbi says, really, Jenny, could you give me an example of like a verse that you love? And the, the, the girl says, you want an example of a Christian scripture that I love? Okay, this is one of my favorite ones, Rabbi. I always meditate about this. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Isn't that beautiful, Rabbi? And sadly, the girl didn't know that it's right here in this week's Torah portion, that the Christians took it from the Old Testament, obviously. But that's what happens if you don't teach your children the beauty, you don't show them the spirituality and the love in Judaism. If they think Judaism is just laws and rules of what you can and cannot do and don't realize that the heart of Judaism, the right after the Shema, hero is the Lord is a God, Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. So that's the second verse, love. Love God and God loves you. And then, how do you connect with God? The third verse of the Shema says, 
study the Torah. How do you connect with God? God is, how do we connect with God? God is not tangible. He's spiritual. We're physical human beings living in a physical world. How are we supposed to connect with God? There's only one way, through the Torah, through his will, through his word, through his consciousness that he revealed to us in the Torah. Just like you and I, how do we connect? By sharing our ideas with each other. I get to know who you are, you get to know I am. We share our desires, our dreams, our wills, our aspirations, our beliefs. God shares with us in the Torah his essence. We can't, God's not corporeal. We can't touch him. We can't see him. But we can understand his mind, his heart, his soul. He revealed that. So the, it's like reading a love letter. You read a love letter, you feel connected to your lover because you see that you feel their soul in the letter. God gave you a love letter. He gave us all a love letter, his Torah. Read it over and over, just like a love letter from your lover. You read it over and over and over. And every time you read it, you feel the love of your lover. This is what God gave us, this beautiful love letter, the Torah. But if you don't study the Torah, how are you supposed to connect with God? So the first verse says, no, there's only God. Love God. How do you feel that loving embrace? The words of Torah should be studied constantly and place them on your heart. Don't just put it in your mind. I'll live in your heart. You got to carry the words of the Torah. It's an emotional connection, not just intellectual. And the very next verse says, and teach it to your children and discuss it with them, whether when you're sitting in your house, whether you're going on the road, when you lie down, when you wake up in the morning. The conversation of Torah of God should be constant in your home. And here we find something fascinating. The al one of the commentaries in Torah says, why does the commandment to teach your Torah, the children Torah come after the commandment to love God and study his Torah? Says the al the only way you could communicate Torah to your children is if they see that you love God and that you study his Torah. If they see that you love God and you study his Torah, then you'll be able to communicate it to your children. Then your children will be receptive. But if you don't love God and you don't study his Torah yourself, you could send your kid to Hebrew school as much as you want. Don't expect anything. You may get lucky. Maybe your kids will gravitate towards it regardless. But the surest way is that they see you as an example of someone who practices love of God and studies the Torah themselves. That's the only way. That's the ultimate way. I shared this morning in my video, so you may see it, but I didn't share this part of the story. Eli Wiesel's uh, fourth yard site, Nobel Prize winner, was just last month in June. He died in 2016. He had a one and only child after the Holocaust. He, he and his wife got married and one child, Alicia. He lives in Manhattan today, this Alicia Wiesel. And he wrote an article about his father. And I shared some of it in the video this morning, so I'm not going to repeat all of it. But something I didn't share was he said that his father tried, you know, imagine survived the Holocaust. He has a one and only child. And he loved him like nothing else. You know, he loved his son so much. But he says, I was a rebellious child. I gave my parents tremendous aggravation. And my parents just kept on loving me. And he said, my father had three messages to me when I was growing up. He said, be a good son, be a good student, and be a good Jew. And he says, I was none of that. He said, I told my, I came home, I want to be a Buddhist. I don't want to be Jewish. I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. And he said, I kept on breaking my father's heart. And he said, what he noticed his father started doing was, his father said, he explains that when he was a kid, his father the Talmud says you have to teach your kids how to swim. So he said that his father hired an instructor, Eli Wiesel, hired him to teach his kid how to swim because the Talmud says you have to teach your kid how to swim. And he said he learned from the swimming lessons that the best way to teach your child is to let them teach them how to let go. You have to let go of your child. And he said what my father did was instead of telling me to be a good son and to be a good student and to be a good Jew, my father started showing me more and more by example. He would revere his parents and talk about his parents' memory who perished in the Holocaust. He would study Torah in front of me constantly to show me how he's learning like a good student. And he would become, go to shul and become more and more observant to show me that he's a good Jew. And he said at the end of his life, and I shared this in the video, when he was on his deathbed, he turned to his father and said, Dad, could I do anything for you? And his father said, just be. He said, meaning I love you unconditionally just for who you are. And he said, my father didn't have to tell me at the end of his life, be a good Jew, be a good son, be a good, be a good uh, student, because he showed me by his example. And that's what the Shema says. You should love God. You should 
study the Torah. And then you'll teach it to your children and your children will be receptive to it because they've seen your example. This is just some of the most beautiful instructions in this week's Torah portion. God willing, in Shabbat, we'll get to read the entire Torah portion. So I want to wish everyone a wonderful day. And again, this Shabbat, first of all, tomorrow night, we begin Tisha B'Av, the day of mourning of the destruction of the temples. Please look at the synagogue schedule. We have a Zoom program tomorrow night, as well as on the conclusion of the fast. And then, God willing, on Shabbat, is Shabbat Nachamu. This is called the Shabbat of Comfort, where God comforts us over the loss of both of our temples. And the ultimate comfort will be, you know, we usually think of comfort as someone, God forbid, someone loses a loved one, we give them comfort. We show them that we empathize with them. We sympathize with them. But God has the ability to give us a comfort that's not the normal kind of comfort. Imagine if you could comfort someone by giving them back their loved one. That's the ultimate comfort, right? I get back my loved one. That's the, there's no need for comfort anymore. And that's what we want. We don't just want God to comfort us that, okay, we're suffering in exile. There's anti-Semitism. There's suffering. There's problems all around the world. We want God to restore the world to the way it should be. We want Mashiach to come. We want the temple to be real. We want a world where there's no evil, where there's no violence, where there's no hatred, where there's no crime, where there's no human envy and hatred towards one another. Don't just comfort us by making, showing us empathy, but giving us back, restoring the world to the way it was, the way it should be originally. And that's what we pray for. And that's the comfort, the consolation that we, God promises us and that we, we yearn for and we pray for. And we know that God will deliver to us, may it be speedily this year. So these are very meaningful and important days ahead of us. And I wish everyone a meaningful fast. The fasting is just to awaken ourselves to be better. Obviously, we don't eat or drink for 24 hours. It's the only other fast that's like Yom Kippur, very, very long fast, not just during the day, but from evening to evening. But the most important thing is to say the prayers of the day. And remember, I see that, uh, uh, you know, the, we, Mordechai put on his picture of the Western Wall so you could see what we're praying towards and what we're yearning for. Um, so thank you for that, Scott. And, uh, you know, we remember Jerusalem and in Jewish tradition, we always remember, we're not just on Tisha B'Av, every time you go to a wedding, the last thing they do is break the glass. The groom breaks the glass. The reason we break the glass is because King David, who was the one who began his reign in Jerusalem after being in Hebron for 30 years, he moved his reign, his capital to Jerusalem. King David's established, uh, you know, Menachem Begin, when he would go to Washington, D.C., he would say, I bring you Greetings from Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital. So, <laughs> so, so King David's capital. And King David says, there you go. Im lo Yerushalayim al Simchasi. If I forget, I, I will always remember Jerusalem at the height of my joy. And that's why at every chuppah we break a glass to remember the brokenness of Jerusalem. So it's not just Tisha B'Av. It's every Jewish occasion. We always remember Jerusalem. We always pray for Jerusalem. In our daily prayers in the Shemon Esri, morning, afternoon, and evening, we have a prayer that says, Return us to Jerusalem. Restore your temple, your service, your worship. Your, the, but the main thing we pray for when we ask for Mashiach is a world filled with the knowledge of Hashem, a world in which all of mankind recognizes their source that we discussed, that would just emanate from Hashem, and a world filled with goodness and love and kindness. So let us pray for that, especially this Shabbat. And uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow night as we uh, observe Tisha B'Av with the Book of Lamentations. And we'll have a special speaker talking about some of the archaeological discoveries uh, from Jerusalem. So I'm wishing everyone a wonderful day. And thank you for joining our Torah class. Thank you very much. Thank you and all the best. Great seeing everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. All the best. Have a good day. You too.